थैंक यू एंड वेलकम बैक आफ्टर ब्रेक और अब ब्रेक के बाद एज ए सेड विल चेंज द एनर्जी स्केल्स एंड कम टू द मेगा इलेक्ट्रॉन वोल स्केल एंड आई टॉक लिटिल बिट अबाउट डिटेक्टर्स फॉर न्यूक्लियर फिजिक्स सो वट आई वॉन्ट टू डू इन नेक्स्ट ट्वेंटी मिनिट्स और सो इज टू जस्ट गिव यू अ फ्लेवर ऑफ डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ डिटेक्टर्स विच आर यूज फॉर वेरियस न्यूक्लियर फिजिक्स एक्सपेरिमेंट्स एज I go along, so I will just start with a few basic concepts. I know that everybody in this uh, audience is very well familiar, and we have had several talks on detectors since yesterday. So I'll really, really rush through this just for the brief recapitulation. Then I want to give a few examples of the detector setups in India, the different accelerator centers. We'll uh, also give you a flavor of what kind of setups are used for the experiments with radioactive ion beams. An example of the gamma ray detector array with the hypernuclei. and somewhat futuristic but the cryogenic detectors and the low background setups which also are for making a part of the various nuclear physics studies today and end with some example of the detector development efforts new efforts in india sorry yeah so just for the brief uh, uh, historical review as you know i thought if you look back the one of the first classic experiments in nuclear physics done by rutherford to uh, prove that the uh, structure of the atom nucleus lying now when you look back the apparatus is rather simple was a very, very clever experiment though so but it was a simple detector and that was a uh, fluorescent screen so a passive detector and from that in about 100 years time we have progressed a lot that even the low energy nuclear physics experiments which we talk about now have many many detectors and one example is you are seen here you will talk more about it later so when we talk the we have been hearing about collider experiments so just to briefly uh, get what when we talk about nuclear physics experiments so here these are mostly the fixed target experiments or experiments with the sources we do have either the normal kinematics or inverse kinematics what i mean is the light beam on the heavy ion or the heavy beam on the light ion heavy in the light is the inverse in that case the reaction products are forward focused whereas in in the normal case you have the reaction products in the uh, most cases four pi at least in the uh, center of mass frame four pi and laboratory it will have the uh, have to cover large angle we also the energy scales or the velocities which we are talking about for particles both are non relativistic and relativistic because if you have a very high energy beams where you do the fragmentation for the uh, rib production you do have the very fast moving particles which are uh, fragments which you detect and this uh, fast particles play a role particularly when you look at the gamma detectors so doppler corrections are important this means you need a more precise measurement of the velocities angles and so on and one of the important factor here is the radiation damage because the when you have the heavy ion detector these are low energy heavy ions so they deposit a lot of energy uh, most of the energy in all these detectors and that leads to the damage so what we want the detectors to do this is again a common list which everybody has seen is basically we want to identify all the reaction products and we want a complete kinematic measurements which means measure the energy momentum angle mass since this uh, nuclear reactions you have the products which are coming out which you have to look at the correlations of it this could be a gamma particle correlations or the particle particle correlations like the in case of fission you have fragments coming out this uh, means a simultaneous detection the coincident detection as well as looking at the time differences and of course we want a large solid angle coverage as also seema pointed out uh, and others also pointed out yesterday in the talks so that any time we want full angle coverage we want high granularity to avoid the pile ups or the multiple particles going into same detector but the high granularity comes with a cost for the read out electronics and so finally you pick and choose and optimize your setup based on what you can afford the detectors do necessarily involve signal processing which is high density high count rate and data filtering and i will not talk about this at all in this uh, in the present talk so what happened yeah so the the types i will not go into details of this but the when a in a typical nuclear reaction when you talk about uh, uh, beams with a few mev per nucleons you are looking at the fusion fission dynamics you are looking at the nuclear structure so these you find either the compound nucleus or there could be elastic inelastic collisions so you look at the uh, nuclei moving 
at a, with a few MeV per nucleon energy. These are the fragments you want to detect. And the main uh, backbone is also the light charge particles emitted along with it and the gamma rays. The gamma rays really give you an information about nuclear structure. So you want to detect those. So the kind of radiations which we are looking for are the charged particles, proton, alpha, and heavy ions, which mostly use the silicon detectors. And this I will talk about as I go along. There are also electrons. You look at conversion electrons and uh, uh, other things uh, coming in the reactions. We also the photons which form the bulk of the detection uh, uh, privilege and so on, and neutrons. Now, photons and neutrons being neutral are difficult to detect because they first have to go through some reaction to make the uh, make the charged product. So, photons here we are talking about are can be few tens of keVs, X-rays, uh, low energy excitations to the few MeVs which can be a discrete state transitions or the things like collective excitations like giant dipole resonances. Neutrons cover a large range of energy, but here it is much different than what you uh, talk about in the high energy collision. So this is a, again up to 20, 25 MeV neutrons. So these are not, uh, these again are detected through either the nuclear reactions, which will produce gammas or produce the other charged particles, but mainly the neutron proton interaction. So the neutron detectors have to be hydrogenous material are preferred and neutrinos, but that I will not talk about. So if we look at the broad classes which are there of the different uh, nuclei, what, what are the uh, I mean different particles and what we get are the, are the gas detectors, which are have been a workhorse for a very, very long time. It gives a good timing, uh, relatively poor energy resolution. And since these uh, charged particles and heavy ion fragments lose a lot of energy in the windows, so they have to, have to use a thin windows. If you want to put a detector behind it, it needs transmission, it requires multiple windows that also give rise to uh, multi, uh, I mean the scattering and energy losses. But the advantage is we can make large size detectors and they are rugged from the point of view of the radiation damage. Typical ionization potential we talk about is about here is concerned is 10 to 25. Minutes. Scintillation detectors, both the organic and inorganic have been uh, very widely used. The organic scintillators uh, give good timing. The inorganic scintillators also give a decent timing and moderate energy resolution. The advantage is you can make large size detectors. You can make it into any odd shapes and I'll give some examples. So because these have materials which have a high Z for the gamma and neutron detection, they have a very high efficiency. And yeah, the typical ionization potentials are similar to the gas detector. So this number I mentioned because this is what is responsible for the resolution as many of you know. The semiconductor detectors, particularly the high purity germanium detectors for the gamma rays and silicon detectors for charged particles have been are expensively used. They give a good energy resolution, moderate timing. They're expensive because the semiconductor large sizes is, is uh, difficult to make. And they're more prone to the radiation damage, but because the excitation energy here for the uh, electron hole pair excitation is low, you get a better resolution. And yesterday we heard about a new class of detectors, which has become now, uh, which has recently come into the picture are the cryogenic detectors, where you actually measure the phonon signal they have a very good energy resolution. Both insulators and superconductors can be made into the cryogenic detectors. The advantage of using superconductor detectors is the excitation energy now is down by almost three orders of magnitude to few milli electron volt. Use your wider choice of materials and consequently you have a good energy resolution. So let's start with some examples of the uh, detectors at the uh, different facilities in India. There are three major accelerator centers in the, for the heavy ion studies in India. The Pelotron Linac facility, BRCTI for Pelotron Linac facility in Mumbai, Inter University Accelerator Center in New Delhi. Both these have a tandem accelerator, 14 MV here and 15 MV in Delhi, followed by a superconducting linear booster and the, and the cyclotron at VCC Kolkata. There are also experiments using the reactor-based neutrons, which are taking up, but uh, the detection techniques will be essentially similar. So I'm not going to talk about this part, but I will focus a bit, I mean, I will uh, touch upon a bit on the low background experiments because there is a uh, move to set up UG lab and there's already one, some uh, prototype experiments are done at Jadugura. Uh, there are also in the in the nuclear physics detectors, which are the mass spectrometers and the ion traps and so on also are used and I will not get into that. So this is an example or this slide gives a kind of a collage of different gas detectors used in uh, uh, nu nuclear physics experiments. So here you see 
a double arm fission time of flight spectrometer. So this is actually a target. The beam comes in. This is the entire thing is in the inside a big vacuum chamber. So this is a two detector uh, telescope, which is the uh, there. So you have a start detector, which is mounted very close to the target, which is a small uh, four by four detector. It's a transmission type MWPC. And then you have a stop detector at the back. So this together uh, mounted on two arms can detect the fission fragments in coincidence. These detectors are uh, you uh, done very uh, designed very carefully with the three uh, wire planes and the advantage is that the intrinsic time resolutions are of the order of 100 picoseconds that is important because the time resolution here delta t effectively translates to the mass resolution and when you are looking for the fission fragments you have one of the things which you study is the mass distribution and the neutrons uh, emitted along with it so for mass distribution that's very important this is another example of the combination of the uh, what is called a hybrid telescope. So there is a gas ionization chamber followed by a silicon detector. And this is um, again for the quasi elastic scattering or the fission angular distribution. See, one thing which is uh, probably uh, uh, nuclear physicists are used to, but for others, just to remind you that in nucleus uh, different reactions or different mass regions as you study, you need to slightly fine tune your detector configurations depending on whether you want to study light mass or heavy ion fragments or uh, uh, different energy gamma rays. So that is these detectors allow you uh, uh, flexibility of doing that. And this is uh, uh, IUSC really has a very nice detector lab and Akhil Jingan has built many of these detectors. Now this, uh, uh, this shows an annular proportional counter with a central hole because when the beam is falling onto the target, you want to look at Coulomb excitation. That means the uh, excited states of nuclei you study in coincidence with the particles which are going out. This helps because if you can look at the position of the particle, you can do a better Doppler correction for the gamma ray. It also helps in clearing up the spectrum. So the annular PPAC is built for that. It has sectors and rings. The rings gives you theta position and the sector segmentation helps you in keeping the count rate in each segment small. These detectors can handle very high count rates up to 10 power 5 particles a second. And the beam, which is forward focus, which is a high intensity, should has to go through the central position. So this is actually a collage. And you see the, here the uh, PPAC mounted on the beam line. And this is uh, this shows the gamma detectors separately. But those uh, uh, the experiment consists of looking at the gammas detected in the clover detectors surrounding the target in coincidence with this. I also would just mention one additional example here, which is the again using one of these uh, MWPC and the solid state detector together. This was used at an uh, uh, experiment at Ganil in France together with a mass spectrometer. So where the fission fragment, the mass spectrometer used, one of the fission fragment was uh, detected in VAMOS and one was detected in this setup. Okay, so this is the example of the scintillator detector arrays using the sodium iodide, which has been one of the uh, traditional uh, scintillators, but lanthanum bromide, which are uh, somewhat novel scintillators. They are, as I mentioned earlier, the scintillators you can make in different shapes. So here you have some of the detectors in pentagon shapes and some in hexagon. And here the detectors are mounted completely to make a four pi coverage. In a typical nuclear reaction, in the compound nucleus fusion happens, you may populate a very high angular momenta. And these most of these angular momenta is dissipated by the emission of gamma rays. So you detect these gamma rays. So from the multiplicity of the gamma rays, you can get the angular momentum. And this array though developed at TIFR was actually coupled to the mass spectrometer in IOAC. So you can measure the residues along as a function of angular momentum. Whereas if you have the lanthanum bromide, the advantage of lanthanum bromide is it has a very good energy resolution and fast timing. So though it's a very expensive detector, it is preferred because of a in much superior energy resolution. And the, uh, these detectors allow you a flexible mountings, which is depending on the experiments. You can do angular distributions and so on. So this setup was used to measure the uh, uh, capture cross sections for 10 boron uh, P gamma reaction, which is of nuclear astrophysics interest. Let me move on to the uh, clover detector array. You may have, most of you would have heard Indian National Gamma Array. This Indian National Gamma Array has been a backbone of nuclear structure research in our country for almost past two decades. 
So when people, we do the gamma uh, detection to study nuclear structure, you want to look at the energy, you want to measure its spin parity because then you get the uh, information of the each nuclear state. And this helps you calculate the wave functions, transition rates, and understand the structure of the nucleus in the model. So to do that, it's important to be able to look at various gammas. And as I told you that you are populating the nuclear, uh, nucleus at a very high angular momentum. So you have a cascade of gamma rays and you want to detect all these gammas, the number of gammas, so high multiplicity events. And uh, so you need a good uh, detection efficiency, good resolution. So to achieve that, uh, the germanium detectors are used. The germanium detectors have to be cooled at liquid nitrogen temperature to get the uh, resolution. So each, each of it has a nitrogen dewar. And in addition, they are used with a uh, Compton suppression shield or anti-Compton uh, anti suppressor. So if anything, any gamma, which is because these are low energy gammas, typically very uh, up to few MeV at the most. So the main interaction is to the Compton and photoelectric. So if there's a Compton scattered gamma, which goes out of a detector, that is the gamma detects partial energy. It's not of very use to you, but it just makes a background. So you use a Compton shield and here you use the scintillators because you just want a high detection efficiency and use it for rejection. And this shows a kind of an improvement which you get with a Compton suppression. The reason I show this is please remember this low energy region that whenever you have a high energy gamma, you always see a background here. And this is something which is which has a relation in many uh, experiments later where we are looking at low, th low energy thresholds, including coherent uh, neutrino scattering. Now, the, uh, when we went from the normal HPG detector arrays to the clover detectors, the advantage was the clover consists of four germaniums together grown as a, a single crystal. So here, when the scattered energy in the neighboring detector can be added back, and that gives an advantage because the effective efficiency which you get for this detector at a high energy is like having a, with a add back, it's like having a six germanium detector. So that was one of the plus points in choosing a clover detector for the Inga array. The other advantage was that you can do a polarization measurement because you have whether uh, you can from angular distribution, you can get the polarity of the gamma ray, multipolarity, but to determine whether it's an electric or magnetic, because it depends on the, uh, the Compton scattering depends on the orientation of the electric vector, it is possible to get that. And the clover detector arrays Inga has played, has uh, uh, provided a unique opportunity to do these polarimeter measurements. Initially, this array, which is uh, envisaged as a 24 clover detector array, was uh, moved from at diff three different centers. As I said, in the last 15 years, it has produced several PhDs and very, very interesting pure physics results. So I just show you here now the uh, one of the uh, experiments where the 12 detectors are put in the VECC. This is a bit dense slide, but just tells you a variety of problems on nuclear structure which can be addressed. In addition to that, uh, uh, VCC has their in-house in uh, in -house clover array of five detectors, which is also coupled with uh, LEPS, which is the electron detector uh, uh, or low energy gamma detectors, which is, uh, uh, which is used along with that. And uh, they have got some very interesting results in the one of the things I must mention last year uh, they got, uh, which was published as a PRL, is that in gold 183 uh, nucleus, they have shown the coexistence, uh, shape coexistence for triaxial nuclei. Now, after having used the clovers and shown that it Inga has really, really helped us in understanding variety of nuclear physics problems, the next step is to move on to the hybrid arrays. And the, the proposal is actually to combine the clover detectors with the lanthanum bromide. If you recall, I told you the lanthanum bromide has a good uh, uh, timing arrangement, so you can measure the sub nanosecond lifetime. Again, a variety of problems can be done, but I would like to focus here just on the detection part and show you the what can be done. So here, this is a example of a, a spectrum with uh, lanthanum bromide and the germanium, just to show the uh, relative resolution. Lanthanum bromide still is much, energy resolution is much poor, but what is uh, important here to understand is we understand the response well, because the response is pro can be reproduced very well with the simulations. And in a typical gamma decay structure, if you see here, if you have an isomer, this will have a longer half-life. And so by looking the relative uh, time measurements, you can study the isomers and their lifetime. So I would like to give you one example where the uh, in 137 lanthanum, a very 
uh, small half-life, 200 of the order of 300 picosecond has been measured. So this is the level structure. You have a, a gamma at a level at 1786 kV decays by 782 gamma. And then there is a level with a 263 picosecond half-life and 169 comes after that. So if you measure a time delay between these two, we can get the half-life from that for measuring the time delay. And the measurement is shown here. The blue actually corresponds to the prompt. That means if there was no, if you look at the uh, gamma gamma coincidence of another level where there is no lifetime. And here the shift in the centroid from the shift in the centroid of this time peak, the lifetime is measured to be 263 picosecond. So this is essentially an illustration of the power of the technique. And this is where one should go on with the gamma spectroscopy. So the combining the clover array with lanthanum bromides and the other ancillary detectors which will be the plans for the coming years at different centers. The neutrons, which is another important uh, radiation to be detected to look for nuclear structure. So in the last uh, few years, we have seen two major uh, neutron arrays coming up. One of them has come up at IUSC, which has a hundred five inch uh, by five inch uh, liquid scintillator detectors. And this is a structure as you can see. And uh, this here neutrons are measured together in coincidence with the fission fragments to uh, study both the dynamics as well as the uh, fission delays. And here is an example where the neutron uh, multiplicity precision, that means before the uh, uh, neutron fragments separate, you can measure the uh, precision neutron multiplicity. And this, uh, the, the their experiment has actually shown that you need a substantial fission hindrance. That means a delay because you see a large amount of uh, uh, precision uh, neutron, uh, neutrons. So this is related to, this gives an information about the nuclear viscosity. The another new, uh, neutron array is also set up at VCC. They also see a good neutron gamma uh, discrimination by the pulse shape in the arrays. Now this has a more flexibility in the arrangements and they have 50 detectors, but they, they also can be arranged in a plane for studying different uh, uh, reactions. So and here this is coupled to the multiplicity detector. So basically depending on the problem you want to study, the, the detectors can be moved around and uh, looked at. Now this was more on the uh, uh, on the setups at the uh, stable beam facilities and in the India. So I just want to give you two examples, particularly focused on the Indian efforts for their uh, experiments with radioactive ion beam facility. The uh, RIBs are challenging because they are much lower intensity and the backgrounds are high. So you will have, there is a talk on the fair, so you will hear more about it. But the detector, uh, the germanium detector, a special type of detector has been proposed at New Star, which is called DGAS. And this detector is developed at GSI in collaboration with uh, uh, a German company. And the partial production of this detector, this is a very complex germanium structure. It will be electrically cooled for making compact uh, uh, mounting arrangement. And this one is the, has a very uh, aluminum alloy vacuum vessel to get the vacuum, as well as the some parts of the preamp are produced in, in uh, TIFR. And this has been now delivered and was used in the experiment at uh, GSI. So here you see a, a degas detector along with a planar germanium. So, uh, and uh, here what was done was with a very uh, high AVI and the uh, 184 platinum is implanted inside the detector because you're looking at a very low energy gamma ray, 49 keV. So this will, uh, uh, this cannot make it to the detector from outside, but once you have implanted, you can look at the decay of that. The other uh, experiment in which uh, uh, we have made a contribution is the Paris, which is the photon array for studies with uh, radioactive ion and stable beam. This is for use primarily for use at spiral and ganil. And this is actually a, a switch is a combination of lanthanum bromide and sodium iodide detector. You can from the pulse shape figure out where the uh, in the gamma deposits most of its energy. The advantage is to use the excellent timing and resolution of lanthanum bromide and use uh, couple it to sodium iodide to reduce the because they are read with a single PMT. This just actually shows how good the lanthanum bromide is. And again, the work here has shown that the add back works very well. This was uh, just to show the power of the detector that this experiment, the Paris was used in uh, at uh, Spiral along with the other detectors, the gamma tracking detectors and VAMOS to study the second two plus excited states in these nuclei. This was important to study the lifetime to understand the effective interaction. 
So the uh, just one example on the study of again hypernuclear. This is again a very important topic because we understand more about nuclear force when we look at hypernuclear, since the interactions uh, like spin-spin interaction can be studied better because neutron proton there is uh, compared to neutron proton. So here again, the uh, looking for the uh, excited state gamma decay cascades and studying the gamma rays is an important uh, tool. But since the intensity is low, the we need to essentially have a closed packing. So this, uh, they necessarily are using the pulse tube refrigerator so that you can get rid of a big door and use it. And the advantage of that is also that you can cool the detector below 85K, which minimizes the neutron induced damage, which is uh, uh, important. And the anti-Compton shield, which they are using is actually PWO, which has, which is faster compared to BGO, but has a lower light output. So this is again, something in which there's an open uh, research and one can go on to that. So let me very, very briefly just go through the uh, cryogenic detectors and low background detectors. This was actually mentioned yesterday that you can use the cryogenic detector where the energy of particle is converted to the thermal energy, which leads to the measurable temperature rise if heat capacity is low. So this is uh, possible because this gives you now a wide range of applications. Most of these detectors operate below 100 millikelvin. So you have uh, photons and particles which can be used for, for various things. Why is attractive? Because devoid of dead layers, self-absorption, reflection at surfaces, all these problems you get rid of. High efficiency. And the resolution is actually dependent only on temperature and heat capacity. It does not depend on energy. But in practice, it's limited by extraneous factors. And you can easily build the large arrays. The, uh, this is an example of a crest dark matter experiment. So you can see that you have the large bolometer array. I'll come back to it if there are any questions. This is another very, uh, in fact, one of the largest bolometer detector, which is the core detector for the neutrino laser double beta decay. It has a thousand detector tower. And now, in fact, we are moving on to the scintillating bolometers because you, you look at both the light and the phonon signal. This helps in, again, a difference here, provides a kind of a PID for the uh, article. When we look for these uh, rare events, or we can also look at rare nuclear decays, the low background experiments are very important. And this is achieved these days with a specially made germanium detectors, which have a carbon body, so the, and also more uh, purified germanium itself. And then you have to do a graded shielding. You also make a, what is called a argon a radon exclusion box because you flow the nitrogen to get rid of the radon coming from natural uh, red, uh, radioactivity. And this uh, efforts have been initiated in India. This is the setup in TIFR. It's a sea level setup at the moment, but the sensitivity for looking for the impurities at a PPB level. These setups can also be used to, uh, to qualify the uh, various materials as well as study the uh, rare decays. So the example one was we looked at a double beta decay to the excited state in 94 zirconium. You would have seen a cascade of gammas and the absence of it, we put a uh, limit on that. And this particularly after Sunanda's talk yesterday, I thought I will just show this because the same setup which we had, uh, I had shown here, we used for looking for the uh, muon induced neutrons and through the NN prime gamma scattering. And actually, when we look at it, you see the giant, these are the two giant versions, the output of just the simulated results and show significant differences. So these measurements like this also help in improving the simulations of the set. So now let me quickly in next three to four minutes talk about the detector developments in progress in India. I just have four examples, so I'll just go through it quickly. So we are trying to develop a tin cryogenic bolometer for looking for a neutrino less double beta decay in uh, uh, 124 tin. So this is a millikelvin refrigerator. And uh, this is the, uh, the NTD germanium sensors, which are developed for millikelvin thermometry. So these are shown to work very well. And this is the response of the bolometer to the phonon signals and uh, the improvements to the detector are in progress. The new liquid scintillators developments have been also taken up in India. So the, you see, you'll hear more about it in the talk by Professor Vivek Datar. So this is uh, mainly because if you want to use it for the large ton size detectors, you need uh, biodegradable, relatively safe solvents and low toxicity. So lab-based detector is done. It works, it has a good light output, but doesn't show very well uh, uh, in gamma discrimination. But it's, this is a deuterated uh, liquid scintillator, which shows a very good in gamma discrimination and will be used in the uh, for the deuteron itself will act as a uh, detector and element. 
Thermal neutron detectors are also developed, which are uh, important to also measure the neutron flux at the underground laboratories and minimize it. So there are two uh, which have been done, which are this uh, gadolinium based and the uh, also lithium six based detector. So this is the thing in progress that would, but they're showing very promising results. The, I, this is my last slide, so I will just end with telling that there, there is an effort to develop the position sensitive gamma ray detectors. This is important for the uh, imaging studies because if the positions gives you, uh, as I said, you need the, the gamma tracking information, but these are also good for the imaging applications in medical, for example. So this is a, a plastic scintillator with a position sensitive PMT, and uh, this is the uh, planar detector. Uh, planar germanium detector imaging with in coincidence with a plastic scintillator using a phi 11. So it should do that. So this is again as a very uh, promising thing. So let me just now end. I hope I have given you a flavor of variety of detector setups developed and operational at major accelerator centers. Uh, in India, cryogenic detectors has wide range of applications for high precision measurements and rare event studies. The imaging and position sensor detectors have wider applications in other areas. I did not talk about the gem, the gas electron multiplier that also has uh, is there. And uh, efforts are underway for development of various scintillators and bolometric detectors. I would have liked to end with a thumbs up commercial. Happy days are here again. But I thought there should not be a copyright issue. So I just say that I think with all these new things coming up, there are a lot of exciting times ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, and then a lot of exciting developments. So, Ohini. I just had a question about your tiles uh, slide. So, is that kind of how ready it is if you were wanted to use it for a neutralized double beta decay setup and? Okay, what that's, is required? Yeah, that's a good question. So the tiles right now is, uh, if you, it's a single germanium detector. So if you want to look for a neutrinoless double beta decay in the germanium, that's the, the, then it acts as a detector. But germanium, we know a large size detector. But what we could do is, and we have done uh, measurements, is that you, uh, if you make an array of a few detectors, then the double beta decay or neutrinoless double beta, beta decay to excited states can be studied. So we did a feasibility study for four such detectors, which is there, but if at least we get a moderate background, we could do uh, some rare TK studies. For example, the one on my card is the zirconium 96 single beta decay, because that is a spin forbidden and uh, so it must happen whether the it is there. So that's something which we have done the feasibility. So if you have four detectors mounting, we can do that with about 500 meter depth. Well, no, no, you talked about uh, cryogenic bolometers. Yeah. So what is the resolution of that? Uh, the one which we have made yet, yes. we have to, re, uh, we still are like a, a silicon detector. We need to get to better resolution. So, so right what's now, the level of energy you can do? I mean, like wattage. So we are looking minus, at, a, at a 5 MeV. I mean, we are looking in a 2 to 10 MeV scale. In energy. Yeah, energy, because we, we will like to make it for the neutrinoless double beta decay in tin, where the endpoint value is uh, close to 2, uh, is less but, than 3 MeV. But a bolometer does measure the energy deposition, right? Yes. So I'm asking, what is that number typically? Yeah. So, so the our goal for making is a tin bolometer to look at 2.28 MeV. Okay. Which is the tin double beta decay energy. Okay. But once we have it, we can use it for something which is in the lower energy. Okay. Yeah. I can talk to them. Now, yeah. Okay. I, I was curious since you know, India has all of these capabilities to do excitations of nuclei and to use these lengthened bromide arrays. And what's your opinion on the Hungarian atom key uh, experiments where they have, you know, the proton on lithium that produces the brillium-8 in the excited state, and they produce the so-called 17 MeV conversion electron, and they did repeated that for the tritium excitation. I mean, what? there's some people who are really excited about that, but it seems like there's few groups in the world that are able to challenge that measurement. So yeah, like so uh, when it came about, it, uh, I uh, point to Gagan because he came and asked us. So there actually, you have to look at the uh, uh, electron-positron pairs, which we were looking at for the decay. So our the, uh, the setup, I, th I think if there's an interest, it can be done with some fine tuning, the setups can be done. But at I the see. moment, it is, uh, uh, it, I would say that, okay, so much interest probably didn't come. But the. Hmm. Uh, what, uh, uh, there's a possibility that it would be looked at uh, 
uh, new facility that has come uh, up in uh, Saha Institute of Nuclear Physics called FRENA. So it's under uh, consideration over there. A repeat of the Frena like uh, atomic like experiment. So, there, their second experiment anyway proved a lot of things, so, and that was done in detail. So, that was there when the first experiment everybody was a bit wary, second one, but yes, I, I mean, I agree it's doable, but probably there should be a little more so, interest in so, 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 a proposal has been made, it's been look, it's being looked at. Well, if you need a tritiated uh, target, I know how to make one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's thank, like, thank Vandana again. <laughs>